come to worship this evening? Have you come to dwell in his house? Have you come to be with the Lord tonight to receive from his presence? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I know it's been a long week. I know you have things going on, but I want you to set that all to the side for a moment and enter into the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands, lift up your voice. God, we magnify you. We worship you, Jesus. Come on, lift up a joyful noise unto the Lord.
which raised Christ Christ from the dead shall quicken our mortal bodies. I want to let him quicken me this evening. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He got back up, you can get back up tonight. The enemy might have knocked you down, but you can get up in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord. Let's give God praise in this house. Oh, why don't you keep those hands lifted if you know there's nothing like the presence of the Lord. Whatever you need, it can be found in His presence here tonight. Let's worship Him. Why don't we just bask in that presence? There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. 
Come on, why don't we just take a second and ruminate in the presence of the King. He is here in this place. Hallelujah. Oh yeah, there's something refreshing about his spirit. When you've come in from a long day and you step into the presence of the king, it's refreshing, it's sweet. There's a healing aspect to it. And I love what I feel in this place. You may return to your seat. Just a couple of brief announcements. If you need an envelope at this time, please raise your hand and the ushers will make sure to bring you one. To all of our first-time guests, if you have not already filled out an information card in the foyer, you can text the word WELCOME to 919-364-5236. We have a special gift for you. Again, that's 919-364-5236, the word WELCOME. Bus meeting tonight, following the service, all those involved in bus ministry, please meet in the ladies' prayer room. Open gym tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m., the Carver Street Gym will be open for volleyball and table games. Everybody's invited to come in and have a good time, fellowship with other brethren and sisters. FBC Youth Activity this Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m. That'll be in the Youth Center. Chinese food and group games. The cost is $5. Fall Festival this Saturday, November 13th, begins at 3 p.m. at the Higginbotham Farm in Creedmoor. Uh, if you are competing in the chili cook-off, please have your chili there no later than 3 p.m. Thank you in advance to all our chili cooks who are participating, and I, uh, I anticipate to see who the winner is. Uh, parking will be in the main, in the fields by the main road. The area around the house is reserved for those handicapped. Uh, carpooling is encouraged. The meal will begin at 4 and go through 6 p.m. After that, s'mores and hot chocolate will be available. If you need the address, check with the others that are here or contact uh, somebody in the foyer and they will have that address. All of this is free of charge. Everybody's welcome to come in for some great food, fun, and fellowship. Care team number one meeting this Sunday after the evening service. Sister Rachel Villalobos team. It will be holiday potluck supper and meeting. If you are part of care team number one, please make plans to attend. Family prayer. Monday, November 15th, here in the sanctuary, and at the same time, it'll be happening for TDV at Gear Street. There will also be a leadership training following that. How many are glad to be a part of a church that's always doing something for the kingdom? Why don't we pray at this time over this offering? Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. We ask you, God, that you touch this offering. Bless it. Multiply it, Lord, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Worship with us as we sing. i 
Calvary's time. your hands to heaven and glorify him tonight have you come to thank him for the blood on a Tuesday night thank God thank God you remember that time in that hospital room you remember when there was a grim report but the church started praying and Isaiah's promises were brought into the 21st century that with his stripes we are healed. Thank God. Oh, we need to thank God. Hallelujah. Here's what your Bible says about the blood. It says that Jesus Christ is not entered into the first tabernacle, but he's entered into the true tabernacle, a spiritual tabernacle that is better than the first tabernacle. And the Bible says that he sprinkles blood in that tabernacle. And that happens when we are washed with pure water. Let me translate that for you. When you get baptized in Jesus' name, there's a great high priest that goes through your heart sprinkling the blood back in the old testament they sprinkled blood of bulls and goats but the bible says he uses his own blood by a new and living way thank god for the blood of jesus hallelujah oh let's lift our hands in this place i feel the holy ghost in this place right now I want you to forget about what happened before you walked in here tonight. I don't want you to worry about what's waiting on you. Can we lift our voices in this house? I want you to open your mouth and I want you to glorify him, thank him, worship him. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We come before your presence, God. We bow our head. We bend our knee before the great king of heaven and earth. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Oh, let's clap our hands unto him and give him thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's good to be in the house of God tonight. Turn to the person next to you and tell him, I'm glad to be in church.
Amen. You can be seated. It's good to have Buddy King visiting with us tonight. Welcome, Buddy. We're glad you're here at the house of God. Came with Brother Billy Meacham. Good to have Cameron with us and Dee Dee with Sister Savannah Henry. Amen. Where are they at tonight? Right back here. God bless you. Welcome. Welcome to FPC. We're glad you came to worship the Lord. Glad you're with us. Good to have Paulino Ramos, Diana, and Milagros Ramos, first time guests of of the Marcus Lopez. God bless you all. Amen. Glad to have you all in the house of the Lord. Praise God. And Sister Tina Michaels used to live here and come to church here up in the balcony. Amen. Right here. God bless you. Welcome. Welcome. We're glad that you're back here. Sister Carolyn Avery is with us. Praise the Lord. And if we don't know your name, we're glad you've come to worship God. You're in the right place tonight. You're in a place where God can touch your body. You're in a place where God can touch your mind. He can set you free. Amen. You don't have to wrestle with all of the doubts that plague you and the devils that try to talk you out of peace of mind. But the Bible says that he will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him. The old timers used to sing the song, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody get your mind on him today. Somebody get your mind. Get it off of your problem. Get it off of your circumstances. Brother Urshan, you don't know what I'm going through. No, but I know he knows what, what you're going through. And he's able. He's exceedingly able. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want you to keep the family of Sister Chris Bird and Sister Dorothy Tanner in your prayers. Um, they had a, their sister Barbara passed away here this last week. Keep them in your prayers. Lift them up before the Lord. They've lost a loved one and and we just want to remember them. God knows that, and God is able to reach his hand into that family and help them and strengthen them and encourage them. Amen. We love this precious family. Also, I want you to remember Sister Nancy Bryant. Um, she's gone through a lot physically, and, and she's had several medical procedures. And in addition to all of that, her husband, Willard Bryant, passed away. So keep her in your prayer that God would just touch her. And, and strengthen her and be with her right where she's at. God is a comforter. Amen. He is a comforter. The Holy Ghost is a comforter. And his funeral will be here, here in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock this Friday, November 12th. So if you want to come and pay your respects and support Sister Bryant, I know she would appreciate that. Amen. When one member of the body is in pain the whole body is in pain we feel that we pray with them and we lift them up it's good to be in a church that loves God and that loves the people of God thank the Lord and I'll mention very quickly that the gym locks have been changed we've had some issues and we've had to uh, fix some things so those locks have been changed if you had an old key you'll need to get a new key if you need access to it you can see sister gail at the welcome desk or see sister karen for that amen why don't we stand in the presence of god i know it's tuesday night i know that many people have been working all day long but it's time to have church <clears throat> amen we've had a great time this week god's poured out his spirit and he's not done yet he's not done yet amen amen this next coming sunday we're going to have brother wade bass back with us again preaching with us again amen bring somebody to the house of god we're going to have a great time in the holy ghost we love brother bass lessons from an alabaster box and my heart awakes what what a wonderful couple of messages they, they ministered to us and and tonight he's back with us he's got so much on his plate he's been working hard traveling the world we're glad that you can be with us tonight in durham with a bass god bless you we want you to take your liberty come preach to us let's give the lord a hand clap of praise 
Well, let's give the Lord Jesus a great hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What a joy it is to be back in the house of worship tonight. And uh, I have certainly enjoyed my time uh, this week in Durham. And I'm just looking for a double portion. <laughs> this is portion number one. We're going to have portion number two this coming weekend. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I, uh, I do sincerely appreciate uh, your good pastor and his wife. I, uh, one of the things that I really, really, first of all, appreciate about your pastor and then what I enjoy in being around him is that I know that our conversation is going to be word-based. He loves the book. He eats the book. He sleeps the book. He drinks the book. He talks the book. He preaches the book. And, and really, I just don't have a whole lot of other things to talk about. I, I know a lot of other guys do, and, you know, I, I might get a chance once a year to fish or maybe once or twice a year to hunt. And, but really, my whole life is so wrapped up in this book. I really I don't have a lot of other interest. Amen. Somebody said, what do you do for pleasure? I go to church. <laughs> How do you have a good time? I go to church. Amen. Amen. And so I'm delighted to be here. I, I appreciate the bishop, love him very much, and give him honor tonight. I want to take you to the book of Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 20. Genesis 8 verse 20 down through verse 22. My wife sends her regards to Sister Urshan and the church family here. She wishes she could be here, but... Uh, she has some physical conditions that prevents her from being able to travel as she has in the past. So I uh, pray for her that the Lord will give her a healing. And um, I'd like to really prefer to have her with me. She's my, she's my number one fan. Amen. And uh, I, I, I all, I'm all, I'm always feel better when she's around because I know I, I got at least one person praying for me anyway. Amen. Genesis 8 and 20. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. For a few minutes tonight, we're going to address this subject. Seasons are certain, but not final. Praise God. I said seasons are certain, but not final. Everybody shout amen. God bless you. You can be seated. <clears throat> Creation story reveals so much to us about how God works. I, I love going back reading and rereading because there's so many uh, nuggets of truth and understanding about how God operates. In Genesis chapter 1, I just feel like there's a template there. There is a pattern that we can be confident that this is how the Lord does his work. 
And one of the things that we note is that it was the spirit that first came to that world that was without form and that uh, it was confused and chaotic. Uh, the darkness was upon the face of the deep. So we know that in the beginning, it was the spirit that moved upon the earth. But then we note from that point that it was the word that began to perform the work. It was the word that produced all things. And God said eight different times. We find it in Genesis chapter one. And God said, indicating that God spoke everything into existence. It came as a result of his word. So the whole world that was created was created by the word of God. But we note in process of time that there were, there were changes. There were things that uh, began to creep into the world. We know sin in the garden and men being a man and um, Adam and Eve being cast out of the garden. And then of course, from that point, uh, the first murder took place and then it escalated as time progressed to a point where the, when God looked at the world, he said that I see that the very imagination of men's minds are evil continuously. So what God looked at was a lot of things in the world that the word had nothing to do with, that the word did not create, that the word did not form. And so he determined that what needed to be done was a judgment, a cleansing, a purging of the world that he had made. And so we understand by scripture that he sent the flood and it was through the flood that he destroyed not so much the world that he made, but what he destroyed was everything that did not look like the word in the beginning. Amen. He cleansed the world of the wickedness and the sin and the ungodliness of that time, and he did it through the flood that he sent upon the earth. One of the things that all of us have to remember according to 1 Peter 1.23 is that you and I have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So you are what you are tonight in God through the word of the Lord. Amen. You didn't get it by singing. You didn't get it by music. You didn't get it by testimonies. You got it by the preaching of the word of God. For God, it pleased God that, in the, that, that through the foolishness of preaching, he would save them that believe. And we understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot even have faith without the preaching of the word of the Lord. I'm gonna say it again. Your faith doesn't come because you heard a good song. And your faith doesn't come because that you heard the latest lyrics. But your faith comes because somebody preaches to you about the greatness of God and what God is able to do and faith arises in your heart. Yeah, Amen, let's clap our hands, let's give him some praise. So you are begotten tonight by the word of the Lord. So whoever you are, whatever you are is because of what God has done in your life through the preaching of the word of God. However, we do know that we are still in this flesh. 
We do know that we are of dual nature. We have the Holy Ghost living inside of us, divine nature, but we're still in the flesh. We're still human beings, and we are carnal at times, and sometimes um, there are things that creep into our life that doesn't look like what God put there through his word. And there are times that God will permit us to go through circumstances. He will go uh, allow us to go through situations. Uh, he will permit us even to go through a storm. And it's never meant to destroy us. It is never meant to destroy what he's done in our life. But it is meant to destroy everything in our life that doesn't look like the word of God. That's why you should never resist the storm. You should never resist the tough times. You should never resist the situations you got to deal with because God is trying to bring you through a purging process so that you can return to what you were when he brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Storms don't come our way to destroy us, but they come to cleanse us, to purge us, and bring us back to where we once were in God. So my prayer is, God, if there's something there that don't look like the word, whatever you gotta do, put me through the washer, put me through the ringer, Put me through whatever I got to go through. I want to be right in the presence and in the eyes of God. Come on, anybody feel that way here tonight? Praise the Lord. Come on, come on, Durham. Can I tell you something tonight? As a church, we ought to be praying that. As a body, we ought to be praying that, saying, God, we want to be a Holy Ghost body. We want to be a holy body. We want to be a revival congregation. Whatever's among us that's not like you, that's not pleasing to you, purge it out, cleanse us, help us. We want to be what you want us to be. Amen. But here's what I find significant tonight about our text, and that is that the, the thing that Noah did in response to the flood, in response to the storm, I read it in verse 20, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord. His first response to the flood was to build an altar unto God. When he had an opportunity to respond to what he had been through and to what the world had been through, he built an altar unto God. Can I submit to you tonight that the absolute best and greatest thing that you can ever do when you're going through a storm is to build an altar unto God. The best thing you can do when you're having problems and trouble is build an altar unto God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. It ain't time to have a pity party. It ain't time to crawl up in a corner and wish you could die. It's not time when you're going through a storm, amen, to, to cry out in pity and pain and sorrow. It's time to find a place and build an altar unto God. It's time to find a place and put your face in the carpet and say, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what all's going on, but there's one thing I know how to do. When I can't do anything else, I can pray. When I can't do anything else, I can find myself in an altar of prayer. Hallelujah. 
he built an altar and offered up a sacrifice unto God. And the Bible said the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. What are we seeing unfolding here? We're seeing that God responds to an altar. It was the altar that God responded to. Can I tell you tonight that it is not your trouble that God will respond to. It will be your altar that he responds to. You can have sorrow. You can have loss. You can have problems. But God doesn't respond to that. He responds to the altar that you build to him. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. If you don't believe it, read your Bible. Look at the time when the, when the disciples are on the boat and they're in the middle of a storm. The wind is blowing. The waves are rocking the boat. They're afraid of their very life. They look like it, they, it to, to them it looks like it's almost over. But Jesus is asleep in the bow of the boat. He was God manifest in flesh. He was, omni, he was omniscient in that he understood everything going on but he never once got up and responded to the storm. But he got up when some disciples came down there and said, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? And he gets up from where he is, steps on the bow of the boat. He, re he responded to their cry. He responded. Come on. You're not hearing me tonight. You got to pray. If you want God to respond to you, find you an altar. You want God to respond to your situation, cry out to him. It is not your need he responds to. It's your prayer of faith. You don't serve an ignorant God tonight. Your God knows what you're going through. Your God knows what you're dealing with. Every single person in this house here tonight, every one of us have our own set of life challenges. Every one of us, amen. Every one of us have challenges where life, where our job, where our family, finances, you name it, we all have challenges. And our God knows every single challenge that you are trying to somehow cope with. He understands that. He sees that. But what he wants you to do is talk to him. Talk to him. Don't cry about your problem. Talk to your God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Too many of us are telling God how big our mountain is when we ought to be telling our mountain how big our God is. We ought to be telling our problem how big our God is. We ought to. Amen. It doesn't matter who you are tonight. You got challenges. Pastor Urshan's got challenges. Wade Bass has got challenges. Bishop Goldair's got, we all got challenges in life and our God knows what those situations are. But what he wants to know is how are you gonna to respond to this? Amen. Come on, God's looking to see how you're gonna respond. And whenever you start praying about it, God says, okay, I can respond now. But I can't respond until somehow you start communicating with me. Till you I'm trying to help somebody here tonight. You want your situation to turn around? Quit crying about your problems and talk to your God about them.
A woman comes to Jesus. Her daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And she approaches the Lord and he stiff arms her. In fact, he tells her, look, lady, I'm not sent. I'm not, I, don't, I didn't come to feed dogs. Huh? I come to feed the children. Come on now. Some of us would get our little feelings hurt if somebody talked to us like that. She had, a, she had a daughter possessed with the devil. She was dealing with a challenge in life. And, and Jesus just stiff arms her. And, and, and the disciples said, and send her away. And, and, and I'm, I'm just going to cut to the chase. The Bible said she fell down and worshiped him. And when she fell down and worshiped him, it changed the dynamics of everything. And when she said, when, hallelujah, when she said, yeah, Lord, you're right, you're right, the bread belongs to the children, but even the dogs eat the crumbs under the children's table, and Jesus couldn't turn her away. She, come on, you hear me tonight. When you start talking to Jesus, there's a complete different dynamic that's created. God always responds to an altar. And so here's what God did. Here's what God did. The Lord set some things in order. He said, all right, here's what I'm going to do while the earth remains. I'm going to make a promise. <laughs> if you build an altar, God will make you some promises. I got to hurry up and move off of this, but I can't help this. I said, if you'll build an altar, God will make you some promises. You want God to make you some promises? Build an altar. He'll talk to you. He'll promise you some things. He made a promise while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day or night, day and night shall not cease. God set in order a simple fact that seasons would never cease. They will never cease as long as the earth remains. And here we are thousands of years later and we are still seeing the evidence of a promise that was made to one man who built one altar unto God. Don't tell me one altar can't make a difference. Don't tell me that one time of, of consecrating yourself to God won't make a difference. Come on. Amen. They've been announced in family prayer at a certain date. Amen. And there's folks that say, well, I'm not going to go to church tonight because it's just going to be prayer. Well, yeah, that's what it's all about. It's just prayer. It's just prayer. It's just prayer. Colossians 1 and 16 said, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The, the psalmist said it on this wise in Psalm 74, 16 and 17, the day is thine, the night also is thine. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Here is what you have to understand. It is God that set seasons in motion. It is God that established the fact that there would be times and seasons. It was the Lord that let it be known summer and winter, cold and heat. It's just going to happen and you may as well get ready for it. And the significant thing about this is in Romans 1 and 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God has so that they are without excuse. That verse is telling us that what God has set in order in nature is mirrored in the spiritual. It's mirrored in what he does in our life. If you want to know why you're going through a certain season, it's because God made that season. It's because God's putting you through that season. It's because God ordained that time. Yeah. 
And before you whine, oh, help me, Jesus. I don't want to get, I don't want to get brutal here tonight. But before you whine and cry and complain about what you're going through, you ought to back up and say, "This is just a season." This is only a season. This is a place that God has put me, but I'm not always going to be here. Seasons are certain, but they're not final. It's not the final time. It's not the final circumstance. It's not my deathbed. And in living for God, if you could grasp the reality of this, it would help you to be patient when you're going through seasons that are not so very good. Hallelujah. Because you see, the winter of life is there for a purpose. Spring is for a purpose. Summer is for a purpose. Fall is for a purpose. Winter serves its purpose. And if you can, uh, if every one of us can understand that, that spring uh, is never going to be all the time, uh, by the same token, uh, it's never winter all the time either. You're gonna go through good times, but good times don't always last. There's gonna be a time of winter, but when you're in the winter, you can say, it ain't gonna last always. <laughs> I know you've heard it, hear it again tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter three. Verse number one, you've heard it before, hear it again. To everything, I said to everything and to everyone. I'm gonna add a little something there because I believe it's right. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to pluck up that which is, uh, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. The preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter three, he touched every single part of our life. He touched every age bracket of our life. He touched every dimension of our life and he said that to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven but there's one thing I noticed he left out there's one thing I noticed he didn't include he never said that there's a time to quit because I don't care what the season is there ain't no time to quit I don't care what you're going through it ain't time to quit. Come on. Come on. You may be crying, but it ain't time to quit. You may be struggling, but it ain't time to quit. You may be in a war, but it ain't time to quit. You may be on the losing end, but it ain't God, I wish somebody would get out and run the aisle right now. I wish somebody would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run. I'm going to let it be known I'm not quitting. No time to quit. I said, no time to quit. I've been lied on, but I never quit. I 
I've been talked about, but I never quit. I've had problems, but I never quit. Come on. Hallelujah. I've been through losses, but I never quit because I never found a place or a time to quit. I feel like having a praise break right now. Hallelujah. I've been up and down, but I hadn't been in and out. I've been up and down, but I never quit. on seasons are certain but they're not final I don't know what you're going through here tonight but that ain't the end I don't know what you're dealing with tonight but it ain't over with there's another season coming there's another time coming there's a change coming in the air Amen. I've been where I didn't know where my next dollar was coming from, but I didn't quit. Huh? Hallelujah. As a young pastor, I know what it was like to go out and, and, and sell. I didn't steal the copper, all right? I didn't steal it. I had legal access to it, but I know what it, I, I know what it is to take 150 foot of, 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 of three strands of, of copper wire that I pulled out of a building that we owned and, and took it down to the, to the place where they cashed out those kinds of things so we could have revival, so we could go ahead and see the, the evangelist stay. We could feed the evangelist and pay him. I know what that's like, but I never once considered quitting. I never once considered giving up. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm trying to help somebody here tonight. I don't care what it looks like, it ain't time to quit. No matter how dark it is, it's not time to quit. It doesn't matter if you don't even know where you're going to put your next step. It ain't time to quit. Come on, don't cut and run now. This thing's just getting started. You know, I find, you can be seated, I found a, a very interesting scripture in 1 Samuel 16 and 13. 1 Samuel 16 and 13, he said, then Samuel took the horn of oil, talking about David, and anointed him, anointed David in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. That's interesting to me because when I read that, Brother Glendo, I realize that that is not spoken in a prophetic sense. It is historical in nature in the sense that whenever that verse was written, the author of that verse, that statement, was a man that could look back over David's life and he could see the hand of God upon him. He could see God with him in every situation and he kept tracing it back, tracing it back, tracing it back until he was able to trace it to the day that Samuel anointed him with oil. 
and he was able to say that the spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. <laughs> what does that tell us? It tells us that when, 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 he, when David had javelins being thrown at him, God was with him. When David faced the lion and the bear on the, uh, out there watching his father's sheep, God was with him. When he was on the battlefield and he faced Goliath, God was with him. When he was running for his life from King Saul, the Lord was with him. When he found himself in the cave of Abdullam hiding for his life, the Lord was with him. When Ziklag, his city was burned and all of his family had been kidnapped, the Lord was with him. Oh, glory to God. The Lord was with him. What are you saying, preacher? I don't care where you are, God's still with you. You may feel like he's forsaken you. You may feel like God's let you down, but he's with you. He's with you. He's right there. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord was with him. Every step that David took, God was with him. Every situation he encountered, God was with him. Some of us sometimes feel like God leaves us. God's not fickle like people. I said, God's not fickle like people. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He said, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. You go in the lion's den, I'll be with you. You go in the fire furnace, I'll be with you. You walk to the Red Sea, I'll be with you. You cross Jordan, I'll be with you. I don't care, I'll be there, I'll be there. You see, because we're human and this is how we respond to things, we look at David and we think that God was only with him and God was blessing him when he ascended the throne and became the king over Israel. Oh, no, 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 no. God had already been with him a long time. Amen. When he brought the ark back, dancing before the Lord with all of his might, God was with him. Sit down because you're not going to be able to take this next statement. You won't be able to take, you won't be able to take it standing up. You better sit down. God was with David when David sinned. I didn't say God approved his sin. I didn't say that God supported his actions. I'm just saying that even in failure, the Lord did not leave him. Come on. Why? Because the goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. I'm trying to help somebody here tonight. Even if you have failed, it doesn't mean God's forsaken you. Because God doesn't want you lost. He doesn't want you destroyed. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He's going to be there to try to bring you back to reality and bring you back to a place that you need to be in him. There were consequences David had to deal with with regards to his sin, but God didn't leave him. And you will have to deal with the consequences of failure and sin, but it doesn't mean that you have to take the position that God has forsaken you and there's no hope. The only time there's no hope and the only time you're truly a failure when you have failed is when you quit. You're not a failure unless you quit. You might fail, but you're not a failure. Come on, my Bible tells me that the righteous man falleth seven times and gets back up again. What's the key? You gotta get back up one more time than when you failed. 
get up, get up, get up again, get up again, get up again. When David repented, God was there. God was with him, even when he sinned and when he repented. If all we knew about David was his sin, then our perception of him would probably be far less than stellar. We not only see him in the season of his failure, but we see him in the season of repentance. Amen. The Bible talks about how the Lord spoke to Elijah. And, and he said to Elijah, I want you to get hints. Turn eastward. Hide yourself by the brook Cherith. That's before Jordan. And he said, I have already commanded the ravens. And they're going to take care of you. They're going to feed you. Well, Elijah had just prophesied three years of drought, no rain, a time of famine. People were gonna die in that situation. And God said, I want you to go down to Cherith. Now there's two things here that are very significant that took an act of faith on the part of Elijah to go down to Cherith. Number one, Cherith, the brook does not flow when there's no rain. Huh? Do a little reading, you'll find out. The brook Cherith does not flow in the dry season. It only flows in the rainy season. And he had just prophesied three years of no rain. So he knew the brook wasn't gonna have water in it. But the Lord said there'll be water for you. You're gonna drink water from the brook. Now, Elijah, this is going to be a season for you that you're going to have to be at the brook Cherith, but don't worry, I'm going to take care of you while you're at the brook. A brook that don't normally run in the dry season, it's going to have water in that brook. <laughs> Secondly, ravens were not providers, they were scavengers. They didn't bring good meat, they brought rotten meat. They were scavengers. They were, they were, they were what we call the uh, feasters of the roadkill. <laughs> it may have been a chariot kill or something. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, they, the ravens were not providers. They were scavengers. So he had to trust God for his water, and he had to trust God for his meat that he would get every evening. He had to have confidence in God for that season. And my my point is that sometimes God puts us in a place that looks like an impossible situation that we could never survive, that we could never make it. But you have to understand, if God makes the season, he also provides what you need to make it through that season, to survive that season. Oh, I really feel the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, church. I said, I really feel the Holy Ghost right now. Amen. Elijah, you go down by the brook Cherith. You got to understand, he's a man of God. He's the prophet of God. He's used to prophesying. He's used to being before the people. He's used to being actively engaged in ministry. Here is a man that his life is wrapped up in doing the will of God, but now he's sitting by a brook, and he's a man that feels like, what good am I? I'm, I'm, I'm totally unproductive. I'm not accomplishing anything. I'm getting nothing done. Done. I'm down here by myself. There's a famine in the land. I'm down here eating this meat every evening and I'm drinking water from the book, brook, but yet I feel so unproductive. And there are people sitting in this house tonight that you are in a season of your life where you feel like you're not getting anywhere, that you are totally unproductive, that your life is at a standstill. You're stagnated. You, don't, you wonder which way is next and what am I going to do? 
Amen. But you have to understand that what God was doing with Elijah is he was getting him ready for a Mount Carmel. He was getting him ready, hallelujah, for fire to fall from the heavens. He was getting... Come on. He was getting him ready for revival. He was getting him ready to see a mighty move of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God upon the earth. I'm trying to tell you, friend, hang on. You may feel like you're accomplishing nothing, but hang on. Everything's going to be all right. Your season is going to change. Your season is coming to a close, and it's going to be a new day. God's got a carnival in your future. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Come on, FPC. Come on, Durham. There's a caramel. I said there's a caramel. There is a cloud. There is a there is a rain storm on the way. Every servant of God has his cherith before he reaches his carmel. Joseph on the road to universal dominion had to have his cherith. He had to go through the pit. He had to go through the prison to get to his carmel. Huh? Even Jesus himself had to have his cherith. Hallelujah. Led up of the spirit into the wilderness. A season of being tempted by the devil. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> but the Bible tells us in the same exact chapter, same chapter that he came out in the power of the spirit. You may enter in that season on this side in one state, but come out the other side in a complete different state. Somebody hear me tonight. Get ready. Get ready. Your season is going to change. Amen. Amen. Sit down. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, but I just got to tell you, I, I, was, I got interested when, I was, when the Lord began to deal with me on this message. I got interested in what, <clears throat> what the effect of seasons were on trees. And as I started... Reading it, I found some very interesting things which helped me to understand why God deals with us the way he deals with us. They made this statement. They said, in the summertime, growth in a tree begins to slow. But that being said, almost all buds containing next year's leaves are set by midsummer. Almost all buds containing next year's leaves are already set in place. Before this tree ever goes through fall, before it ever goes through winter, there's some things already in place just waiting on the season. Well, the devil said, look at you. You ain't no good for anything. You're, you're, you're not being productive. You're not. That's all right, devil. I want to tell you right now, I already got some stuff in place. God's already set some things in order. I've already got buds in place. They're just waiting on me to get through fall. They're just waiting on me to get through winter. That's all I got to do. I just got to survive the next two seasons. Amen. 
This article I read went on to say that trees begin their preparation for dormancy in fall so they can survive through the winter. They begin their preparation in fall so they can survive the winter. You know what most of our problems are oftentimes is we wait to get prepared. Joseph did not spend seven good years trying to abort seven lean years. He spent seven good years getting ready for seven bad years because he knew seven good years was the season of harvest. Seven good years was the season of preparation, but we're gonna have a tough time here for about seven years, so we better get ready. Huh? That's why when you come to church on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you ought to be packing your pockets full. You ought to be getting everything, single thing you can because you don't know what's going to happen on Monday. You don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday. You don't know what's going to happen by Friday. You need to have enough inside of you that you can survive whatever the devil throws at you all week long. Get ready. You need to prepare yourself. Good times don't last always, but neither do bad times. It, it made this statement. It said that in deciduous trees, <clears throat> A layer of scar tissue is formed between the leaf and the branch. And that's where that scar tissue is. It's known as the abscission zone. And when that scar tissue forms, then by a combination of gravity and wind, that leaf snaps off. We're in the fall season. And a tree's got scars on it. Come on now. I said, in, in, in the season of fall, you look at the tree, it's got scars all over it. But don't judge that tree by its scars. Come on. Don't judge your brother, don't judge your sister by their scars. That is where something used to live. That, they're going through a season getting ready for some new growth, a new leaf. Come on. Don't judge me by my scars. Huh? Hey, Thomas, here's my scars, but don't judge me by my scars. I'm alive. Put your finger right here and feel that scar. Put your hand right here and feel that scar. But don't judge me by those scars. I'm alive. That's where, that's, that was when I went through my crucifixion. That was when I was in the season of sacrifice. That's when I, oh no, 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 don't judge me by that. Judge me by the fact I came out of the grave. I resurrected and I'm alive. Come on, every one of us has scars tonight, but thank God we're alive. Devil, we're still here. We're still here. Amen. Don't judge a tree by the season of winter. Don't ever judge your brother or your sister when they're going through winter time. Don't judge them by that. In just a few days, you're gonna look around here and there's gonna be trees all around this place that don't have a leaf on them anywhere. They're gonna look as dead as they can be. 
but they ain't dead. They're just going through a season. All right, I'm almost done. Are you ready? Here's what it says. In that article, it said, starting in spring, trees began reacting to increasingly longer periods of daylight and warming temperatures. And the reason is because trees can't read the almanac. <laughs> trees don't know when it's the first day of spring. The only thing a tree has to go by is the fact that there's longer periods of daylight and the atmosphere is changing. It's getting warmer. And it said when that starts happening, it said cued by specialized detection cells, buds begin to open and new layers, new leaves begin to expand. Hallelujah. There's some detection cells. Come on, musicians, singers, y'all hurry, y'all run. Run, run, don't drag around, run. Amen, I feel something about to happen in the Holy Ghost. I said, cued by some specialized detection cells. They start sending a signal to the bud. It's time to come out of where you are. It's time to show yourself. Huh? Come on, you don't ever know when the season's gonna change. It's the fact that suddenly you feel a change in the atmosphere. Suddenly you feel like something's different. You've been, you've been struggling, you've been laboring, you've been working, you've been just staying faithful. And you feel like your prayers are not even getting past the ceiling. Your words just dribble off the end of your chin. But then on one early morning, about 5.30, you walk into the house of worship and you're walking toward the altar and suddenly you feel something. You feel a change in the atmosphere. Hallelujah. You feel a difference and you start thinking, I think, I think my season's about to change. Hey, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to say something that I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight to First Pentecostal Church. You may have been through some winter, but I feel like spring is here. I feel revival in the air. Hallelujah. The devil wants to judge you by your scars. People want to judge you by your losses. But the Lord is saying, get ready. Is there anybody in the house? You feel a change. You feel a change in the atmosphere. You feel a change in the spirit. You feel like a new season's on its way. Come on. I don't know whether you know it or not, but I'm gonna tell you this in the Holy Ghost, that there's some buds that you don't even know their name yet. But six months ago, God put them in this church. Six months ago, God put them in this tree. They're about to show up. I said they're about to show up. It may be your co-worker. It may be your family member. It may be a neighbor. It may be a friend. Come on, come on but they're about to pop out of where they've been. God already knows. I said, God already knows. God already knows who's gonna get the Holy Ghost this Sunday. God already knows who's gonna get baptized around here during the rest of this week. It didn't happen yesterday. It's because God set some things in order months ago. Come on, 
on now. Seasons are certain, but they're not final. Get ready for spring. Get ready for revival. Get ready for a breakout. Get ready for a breakthrough. Get ready. Sit there, she don't sing me no tearjerker tonight. Hallelujah. I want a foot stomping, hand clapping, atmosphere changing. I wish some of y'all would cut loose right now and worship before they ever start singing. Are you ready for a new season at First Pentecostal Church, Durham, North Carolina? Are you ready? and I'm not going to take any more time. But I really think we ought to just get involved in some radical worship right now. Radical praise. You ain't got enough room, go down the aisle. You ain't got enough room, find you some room. We ought to have some radical shouting, radical dancing. Come on. We don't need pretty Pentecost tonight. We need powerful Pentecost. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Some of y'all need to shout like you had shouted in a long time. You ought to shout like you just got the Holy Ghost.
how many believe he'll make it all right? It's just a season. Springtime's coming. The water's warming up. The temperature's rising. I'm coming out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I read in my Bible where the people of God in several different places, they were going through a season and they didn't know if they were going to live or not. They didn't know if they were going to make it or not. But one thing they knew, they knew that God was well able. <laughs> Hallelujah. You might think you're in a lion's den right now. You might think it's the end of the road and you've made your peace with God. But the Bible said that the next day they pulled the stone away and the king cried down, Oh, Daniel, has your God been able to deliver you? Daniel answered back, Oh, king, God delivered me and shut the mouths of the lion. I want to tell somebody if it's not all right, he can make it all right. If it's not all right, God can make it all right. Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He'll make it all right. He'll make a way. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sometimes God will pull you out of it. Sometimes God will end the story. In one case, the Bible says that he allowed John the Baptist to die in the situation. That's God's business. But I read in one place where he said to live is Christ and to die is gain. You got to get that mindset. I told Sister Urshan one time, she said, baby, you're going knocking doors over there in that dangerous area. I said, honey, all they can do is kill me. Amen. Life insurance is paid up. <laughs> I'm prayed up. The kingdom of God is going up. And then sometimes, sometimes God knows how to just deliver you out of that circumstance. Hallelujah. God knows how to deliver you. Man, I feel a boldness rising up in this place right now. I feel a confidence rising up in this place right now. He told him about Shata. I don't know what the devil told you before you walked in, but he's a liar. You got to get a, a Shadrach, Meshach, a Abednego spirit about you that says, Oh, King, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If our God wants to deliver us, he can. And if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. He's going to make it all right. If I die, it's gain. If I live, he's exalted. But no matter what happens, he'll make it all right. Oh, let's lift our hands to heaven. Let's love him right now. Let's love the Lord in this place. Let's thank him for his wonderful spirit. The rich outpouring of the presence of God. The exceeding great riches of his glory. Hallelujah. The great riches of the full assurance of understanding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Bass, for preaching to us. Amen. Seasons are coming. It's not a matter of if the storm's coming. It's when the storm comes. But it's not final.
My chapter's not over. Your chapter's not over. God's got plans. God's got buds that are just waiting to open up. We got any buds in here that are just waiting to open up? You can feel God just kind of opening things up. Ha, ha. There's hope of a tree when it is cut down that at the scent of water, it will live again. I've got the scent of water in this service tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise, thanksgiving for his wonderful, wonderful blessing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a wonderful atmosphere. Amen. There's faith. There's hope. There's, there's Bible studies. There's new souls. There's people being baptized, people being filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm excited about what God's going to do. I'm looking forward to this next week. I believe God is going to do something miraculous in this place. Amen. Amen, amen. Be looking forward to Friday night, the youth activity, Saturday, the fall festival. We want to see you there. We've got chili. I'm looking forward to testing out this chili, seeing if it passes the test. <laughs> Praise God. Take the blessing of the Lord with you as you go. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you in Jesus' name.